Right, hopefully you can hear me. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, faculty, students, you're all. On behalf of Johns Hopkins SICE, welcome to the presentation and panel discussion of the 2023 Conflict Management Study Trip Report titled El Salvador Exiting the Cycle of Gang-Related Violence. My name is Sinisha Vukovic and I'm a senior lecturer of conflict management and global policy and the director of the global policy program here at SICE. As part of my teaching and mentoring responsibilities, I've been tasked to lead the annual conflict management study trip designed as a capstone level course through which students get a rare opportunity to study a particular conflict affected society using analytical tools of conflict management as their baseline. I'm particularly honored that to welcome my predecessor uh, who has spearheaded this course since its inception, Professor Bill Zartman, uh, a, a long-term director of the Conflict Management Program here at SAIS. Uh, he was a director uh, for decades. He started this course, he designed it, and uh, led it until SAIS decided to radically reform. And even with this transformation and the elimination of the program structure at SAIS, this course endured as a true testimony of a stellar legacy of the conflict management program that Professor Zartman developed. Now, surprisingly, this course has been emulated and used as a reference point for a range of similar courses at SICE that aspire to provide high quality experiential learning experience. I was not aware, maybe this is a statistic that everyone should know, that this trip to El Salvador is the actual 20th iteration of the conflict management uh, study trip. In the past, students have studied a range of interstate and intrastate conflicts, all at different stages of their escalatory potential. We have studied conflict dynamics in Haiti twice, in Kosovo twice, Mindanao twice, Colombia twice. We also went to Northern Ireland, Casamance, in Senegal, Sri Lanka, Korea, Tunisia, Cyprus, Ethiopia, Ukraine. We studied Israel and Palestine, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. Each one of these trips yielded a comprehensive report, some of which are at display for you to grab on your way out, and all of them are available in electronic format. They represent an edited volume consisting of timely and thought-provoking analysis of ongoing conflicts by students who aspire to enter the vibrant field of conflict resolution and peacemaking. In the past, many of our students in this course had the opportunity to study the situation as it unfolds from up close and this was a true turning point for them a pivotal moment that propelled them into careers that allow them to deal with such issues as part of their professional calling hopefully some of them are with us today most likely by zoom as they know how unique these reports tend to get as you may have already deduced from the list of countries and places we studied thus far, our analysis have primarily focused on a set of fairly clear assumptions. Some situations were studied through the lenses of peacemaking, others through peace building, some explored prevention, others looked into intractability. Yet all these conflicts had one thing in common. They were armed conflicts with very clear conflicting parties who promote and defend very specific political agendas. This year, we radically changed the pace. We decided to venture into uncharted territory for the conflict management field. We decided to explore the dynamics that are often overlooked, neglected, and as such, understudied. El Salvador has been on our radar for decades. It is a fascinating country with incredible history and an even more incredible story that has inspired conflict management as a field for generations. To know and understand the peacemaking dynamics that ended the devastating civil war in 1992 is a genuine starting point for anyone interested in conflict management. Similarly, the challenges of peace building, state building, nation building in post-agreement El Salvador remain an endless source of inspiration and guidance for the scholarly and policy community alike. Yet the ongoing situation in El Salvador significantly defies the assumptions and conceptual underpinnings of our field. The actors are different this time. While the contemporary conflict management literature has become very good at dissecting the capacity of governments to engage with terrorists and radical extremists, those that officially we do not negotiate with, there is shockingly little on how to engage with even more difficult actors, criminal gangs, actors that pose an even greater sociopolitical risk. 
Along with new emerging actors, there is also an issue of blurred stages. For any sound analysis, as you may know, of armed conflict, the starting point is to conduct a diagnosis, a detect the stage where the conflict is in. Yet in the case that we have studied for the past six months, the stage is difficult to associate with anything we have been operating with thus far. It resembles post-conflict environments, yet it defies the classical approaches of peace building that see various forms of power sharing, policies of inclusion, and political mainstreaming of former insurgents. These and other issues have provoked our analytical curiosity. We decided to study El Salvador up close without trying to force any analytical or policy assumption from other contexts into it. We tried to learn from the ongoing socio-political dynamics, how decisions are made, what informs them, what are the trajectories that can be observed, how are different stakeholders prioritizing their policy choices. To that end, in the third week of March, while most of other students enjoy their spring break, these students traveled to El Salvador for an incredibly high-paced study trip. 23 meetings in five days to be exact, back-to-back -back meetings with incredible insights. You should understand that these students were not shell-shocked by such a, a jam-packed agenda. In fact, in preparation for this trip, they were incredibly fortunate to have had the support from the lead experts on El Salvador in the DC area. They selflessly provided guest talks, meeting our needs and addressing all our research goals in a superbly insightful manner. I would like to thank them all again for being an instrumental part of this project. While in El Salvador, we were fortunate and honored to have had an unprecedented access to key stakeholders, ranging from government officials, such as His Excellency Vice President Felix Ulloa, Minister of Security and Justice Villatorro, Ministry of Economy, leading civil society organizations, human rights activists, academic community, diplomatic representations of the US and the EU, the whole UN system, including the UNDP and the World Bank, key experts in the country, and many more. Each meeting was conducted based on Chatham House rules and for non-attribution purposes. Each meeting was amazingly insightful and enriching. Each interlocutor provided a wealth of insights and viewpoints, frequently at odds with other perspectives, adding to the richness of our study. Our approach was never to take sides, advocate for any specific policy, or press on any specific normative claim. We were interested to embrace this multi-perspective approach and scrutinize the diversity of ideas and policy goals we were exposed throughout the trip. As you will see from the presentations that follow, based on our preparations for the trip, students have tried to cast a wide net and offer one of the most comprehensive studies of the situation at hand. The ambition is not to preach politics or to forecast the future. Equally, their goal is not to pretend that this is an exhaustive study that ends all discussions. On the contrary, this is an attempt by a, a group of ambitious, driven, and very well-informed advanced graduate students to join the debate and offer a viewpoint that may be of use for those observing El Salvador in situations of similar complexity. The report, as we like to refer to it, consists of 16 individual studies of different topics that cover themes such as peacemaking, or the lack thereof, peace building, exemplified by issues such as good governance, long-term sustainable peace, and transitional justice. For the purposes of expediency, we have invited four students to act as spokespersons for their respective groups, groups that will reflect the shared thread across four individual papers. We hope that you will find your, their analysis inspiring and thought-provoking. So we have left 45 minutes for a subsequent Q&A on all papers that are part of this project. Authors will be called to answer whenever a question is directed towards their work. This is their capstone level project, their moment to shine, and prove to everyone that they have a lot to say and give to the vibrant and growing conflict management expert community. Now, before I yield the floor to the presenters, I would like to express my utmost gratitude to Marianne Viadauri, my doctoral student here at SAIS, who has been instrumental in planning and organizing such an uh, uh, unprecedented trip. So thank you, Marianne. I know you're watching by Zoom. Also, I owe an immense gratitude to my assistant for this course, Angel Chica Sanchez, whose work, perseverance, discipline, and professionalism has made this trip an absolute success. Thank you very much, Angel, for everything you have done for this course. And finally, I would like to thank my students for their amazingly commendable performance throughout the course, your diligence and hard work. 
your analytical curiosity and empirical rigor. You embrace this rare opportunity for a high-paced experiential course and deliver the final product that makes us all proud. You are a true example of what sets sites apart from everyone that aspires to be our competition. Yet we're the only ones that can proudly showcase such a capstone level product of publishable quality that in the years to come will remain and reaffirm your brilliant work as graduate students. Thank you all for making this experience memorable and setting a high bar for the generations to come. Now, with that in mind, please allow me to thank you all for joining us today. It is a great honor to have you here with SAIS. Thank you. We will start with the presentations and the first presentation will be by Willa Lerner. Thank you, Professor Vukovic for that introduction. I'm happy to be able to start things off today as the representative for the first group of students who focused our research on understanding the Salvadoran gangs as they were portrayed and addressed by the Salvadoran government during the state of exception. The state of exception began a little over a year ago when the gangs in El Salvador committed a series of horrific murders, killing 87 Salvadorans over the course of one weekend. In response and at the request of President Bukele, the Salvadoran Legislative Assembly approved a 30-day state of exception, suspending four constitutional rights, removing oversight of public spending, and amending the penal code to allow the government to enact a swift and all-encompassing crackdown on the gangs. The state of exception has since been renewed 13 times and nearly 70,000 alleged gang members have been arrested. According to government reports, the state of exception has led to an unprecedented drop in homicides and extortions, and as a result, there's little expectation that it will be repealed anytime soon. With that background, I want to turn to the research of my colleague Cameron Vega, who explored the impact of the state of exception as a tool of securitization, especially in its use against a group or population with little societal support, and addressed its potential implications for the rule of law and democratic governance. Securitization is a rhetorical transformation of a societal problem into a security problem. States or politicians can create a security problem by labeling the social issue as a matter of security. In other words, a security problem exists when the government says that it does. And using this label then, the government can claim the right to use an extraordinary measure to deal with the issue. One of these extraordinary measures is the use of a state of exception, a policy deviation in which the state addresses a security problem by suspending or going outside the typical constitutional order. The two phenomena interact, Cameron notes, in that securitization creates the conditions for the state of exception and the state of exception perpetuates the conditions for securitization. As Cameron finds in his research, since these measures suspend rights, it is important for state actors to foster and retain public support for its actions. They can't successfully securitize every issue, so they choose issues that they can rally the people around. In this sense, it is particularly easy for state actors to securitize an unpopular or apolitical population, such as gangs. A state of exception poses a unique danger as it inherently allows for a degree of impunity. In unstable democracies, this can lead to democratic backsliding if the governments try to use perceptions of a continued security threat to intervene in electoral processes, capture the judiciary during a suspension of the rule of law, securitize civil society in the media, or enact arbitrary arrests and detentions. Regarding El Salvador, Cameron suggests that the Bukele administration's use of a state of exception again reflects two important and interconnected phenomena. The government believed that it had the capabilities to address the gang problem, and the government believed that it could not successfully utilize these capabilities without suspending the constitutional order. As a result, the government needed to position the gang problem as a security problem to enact a state of exception. The fragility of El Salvador's democracy has allowed Bukele to further capitalize on his government's expanded capabilities under the state of exception. Since the state of exception has been imposed, the Bukele administration has again suspended four constitutional rights, including the rights to privacy, association, assembly, and limited detention. They've sought to centralize elections through municipal shrinkage and absentee voting. They've removed public oversight of finances due to national security concerns. And they've described the gangs, civil society, and the media as terrorists. The El Salvador case also demonstrates the unique dangers of securitized policy being used against gangs. Again, given the gang's unpopularity and lack of political ideology, few civilians or government officials are likely to protect them from the potential abuses of the state of exception. The few advocates they do have, like civil society and the media, can be suppressed, driven out of the country, and thereby blunting oversight and accountability. Cameron also finds in his research that the securitization of gangs 
offers a unique example of the conflict management complexities that arise when a socioeconomic problem, like the motivations for gang membership, is turned into a security problem. For the Bukele administration to address the gang problem as a socioeconomic problem now, it would have to desecuritize the gangs. This desecuritization de poses a political challenge, as, Bu as Bukele's efforts to rehabilitate or reintegrate the gangs would likely prove unpopular after the government has spent more than a year securitizing the gang members. As a result, the path forward for resolving the conflict and mitigating impunity is much less clear. Turning to my research, I also sought to understand the role of securitization in Bukele's response to the gangs. But rather than focusing on the security policy itself, I examined how governments can prepare their constituents and their audience to accept the extraordinary security, security measures through the use of strategic narratives. Strategic narratives are differentiated from other forms of political messaging by their use of storylines or plot devices and other narrative elements, like a cast of characters, settings, or morals, or a call to action. And these strategic narratives are often built around rhetorical frames. These frames emphasize specific ideas that are associated with an issue and then shape public understanding of that issue by narrowing attention to only a few key elements. Frames can often take two forms, episodic frames, which describe the specific, a specific case representative of a bigger issue and typically attribute the cause of that issue to a single individual or group, or thematic frames, which present a broader collection of evidence about an issue and attribute its cause to society as a whole. This framing then influences perceptions of the type of policy that is appropriate to resolve the issue. Consequently, strategic narrators can use episodic and thematic frames to garner support for their preferred policy response. In the case of El Salvador, I looked at how Bukele's frames and rhetoric shifted throughout his time in office. A couple of examples. In his inaugural speech, Bukele barely mentioned the gangs. Instead, he offered an image of El Salvador as a sick child for whom all Salvadorans would need to sacrifice and support to ensure a return to good health. Shortly thereafter, though, Bukele launched his first security policy, the Territorial Control Plan. And by the time he gave a speech commemorating his first 100 days in office, he had a much stronger law and, er law and order narrative built on a series of frames that he repeatedly returned to during his time in office. Particularly, he characterized the previous administrations as villains whose corruptions and weakness allowed the gangs to become entrenched. And he, made a, he issued a plot that he was attacking insecurity with the Territorial Control Plan and seeking to restore security and tranquility to Salvadoran families. With these narrative elements in place, I found that Bukele was then able to intensify his securitizing rhetoric to counter political threats without alienating his audience. Again, an example. In September 2020, El Faro, an online investigative newspaper in El Salvador, accused Bukele of negotiating with the gangs. In his dismissal of the allegations, Bukele repeatedly described the gangs as terrorists, shared criticisms from international actors regarding poor prison conditions, and repeated his characterizations of the previous administrations as having negotiated with the blood of the Salvadoran people, all elements that emphasize his aggressive approach to the gangs. And his persistent popularity after these allegations suggests that his narrative resonated and outperformed the narrative of his critics. In the period between the 2020 allegations and the 2022 state of exception, Bukele used his presidential pulpit to repeat these frames and crowd out competing narratives. Interestingly, I found that he relied heavily on thematic framing, rarely addressing specific instances of violence, but rather talking about the gangs as a sweeping society-wide issue that would require society-wide support, thereby laying the groundwork for the state of exception. After the murders of March 27th, Bukele further intensified his rhetoric as he deployed the state of exception, labeling the gangs as terrorists on a near daily basis and concluding his social media posts with the hashtag war against gangs, implicitly justifying the extraordinary security policy by framing the gangs as an existential threat. These securitizing frames appear to have resonated strongly. Even when Salvadorans acknowledge that wrongful arrests have occurred, many of them continue to support Bukele's approach and accept the provisions of the state of exception as a necessary cost for achieving security. My research suggests that having already built a strong narrative arc, Bukele was then able to frame the state of exception as a climax or turning point signaling the beginning of conflict resolution. Without the other narrative elements though, the abrupt suspension of rights and mass arrests likely have pro provoked greater resistance from Salvadorans. Both my research and Cameron's research found that the government has repeatedly labeled the gangs solely as a security problem rather than a socioeconomic issue. My colleague, Tiffany Oduber's research offers an explanation as to why that is so harmful and what opportunities exist to resolve it. First, Tiffany's research notes that consist there's <laughs> Tiffany notes that research consistently links social, ex social exclusion to gang membership as socially excluded people often join gangs to find belonging, identity, and social support. These social and structural factors may make gang membership 
more appealing when family and community structures are weak, social programs are limited, and there's a lack of general education. These are factors that become even more difficult to provide in moments when a country is in a state of exception. I'll walk through some of the key factors that Tiffany addresses. Starting with education. Low education quality causes high dropout rates and leaves more young people without basic knowledge and skills. Urban and rural poor, minorities, youth of illiterate parents, and indigenous women often have faced unequal access to high quality education. Many young people who leave school for work are exposed to juvenile gangs, crime, and poverty. Salvadoran youth often finish only six grades out of nine, and current research predicts that a further educational decline will occur due to rising rates of non-attendance and dropouts and the digital divide and lack of accessibility. Thus far, the Bukele administration has prioritized education reform, increasing their budget to provide free school supplies to elementary and secondary students, and easing the financial burden on families. The Ministry of Economy is also planning a new digital talent project with complementary training and certification linked to digital transformation. The First Lady has also been involved in youth and education, revamping the Crecer Juntos program launched by the previous administration, the World Bank, and other partners. The program includes social services, community development, and monetary distributions. Monthly payments help eligible households pay for food, clothing, and education. Tiffany notes, though, that this is not enough, and there is need for more internet access, accessible education, and job training program, programs. Regarding these social programs, Tiffany's research found that three quarters of Salvadoran households are socially excluded due to job insecurity, material deprivation, and limited social participation and citizenship. Economic means, and more crucially, the demand for identification and social, social participation drive juvenile gang membership in El Salvador. One way the Bukele administration has attempted to address this is through the creation of Kubos. The Directorate for the Restoration of the Social Fabric maintains Kubos in many towns to prevent violence and provide opportunities for young people. Currently, El Salvador has 11 Kubos. As we saw during our trip, Kubos have libraries, play areas, gyms, reading rooms, video games, and computers. And El Salvador proponents praise Kubos as a visionary urban development plan, while opponents call it a top-down authoritarian strategy that ignores the rights and interests of the poor. However, these Kubos have proven to be relevant to the targeted youth, as kids are actively participating in programs like art, reading, rapping, and other community gatherings. According to Tiffany's research, they're a good start, but the social system needs more. These tablets and cubes will not work in communities where the youth live with the ghosts and legacies of criminal gangs. Ultimately, Tiffany argues that social initiatives should be prioritized before security in El Salvador. Communities should be allowed to build local government institutions, gain greater autonomy, and include younger generations. Young people should be able to engage in more comprehensive social programs and stronger education programs with economic and job opportunities. The government must spend heavily on social programs to improve community social circumstances. Programs to reduce gang membership should emphasize changing kids' criminal lifestyles, especially their involvement in delinquent activities and the availability of drugs and alcohol. The government should also explore how to maintain kubos and extend social initiatives that encourage education and social involvement. Job training, coaching, and support services could enable individuals to overcome school, transportation, and housing barriers by helping them find employment and housing to break the cycle of poverty and crime. Whether it's through foreign financing or local initiatives, Tiffany argues that there should be checks and balances to strengthen the communities and the opportunities available to future generations. Finally, to round out our group, my colleague Nora Abdullahu examined gang resilience and adaptability in response to the government's current style of engagement. She found that the role of gangs as non-state actors has evolved with the domestic and economic, domestic economic and political environments, like Tiffany's research suggested, with specific correlations between increased violence and extortion and political and economic deterioration. In particular, the lack of political reach from the central government allows gangs to expand their operations by gradually seizing control of an area, threatening locals with extortion, and deploying their own form of policing. The resilience and the growth of the gangs can be explained by the basic gang typology in El Salvador, which follows a hybrid model that includes both elements of street gangs and transnational criminal organizations. For example, Nora found in her research that the MS-13 gang structure is not anchored in drug trafficking, as many people think, but rather that there are cliques within the gangs that have significant ties to the cartels. Each of these cliques' diverse crime patterns then makes comprehensive action by the state more difficult. As Nora found in her research, in Central America, the decentralized nature of the non-state actor groups means that although Monodura efforts to decapitate gang leadership might result in short-term concessions, in the long term, gang leaders have shown resiliency by operating from within prisons. Beyond this, even when prison leadership communication is cut off from the clique, the local cliques maintain their operations as new leaders rise within their communities. Historically, Monodura policies in El Salvador have resulted in high arrest rates, an overwhelmed prison system, and inadequate management of inmates. As a result, 
the gangs have been able to organize leaders who can manage the gang structures from within the prison. Beginning in 2009, the Salvadoran government began negotiating with MS-13, and in 2012, they established a truce, the Pax Mafiosa, that reduced punishment for gang-related crimes and made payments in exchange for reduced homicide rates. As Nora suggests, this had a couple of consequences. The truce negotiation offered the gang leaders the legitimacy and political power necessary to influence the government, and it gave the gangs an opportunity to organize themselves to better function within the framework of the state and position themselves as an equal party to the state. For example, Nora found that there are now designated negotiators within, negotiators within the gangs who mediate on behalf of the leaders in prison and designated financial managers who manage the inflow of profit. And the negotiations also allowed the gangs to learn how to leverage homicides at the negotiating table. This new level of public authority from the gangs has weakened the state's power and influence locally. The lack of governmental influence at the local level can also be attributed to the corruption as politicians' willingness to interact with gangs through, through corrupt means undermines the political process. High levels of corruption spoiled the success of the negotiations and the Pax Mafiosa collapsed in 2014. Since then, the Salvadoran public's fatigue with the corruption and lack of government prosecution of the gangs has cultivated the condition for President, President Bukele's state of exception. In her research, Nora found that under the state of exception, the gangs have learned key organizational lessons that contribute to their resilience, including rethinking their crime patterns, trickling more power down to quick leaders, and fragmenting more within their communities. Nora suggests that two scenarios are likely for the future of Salvadoran gangs following the state of exception. Rather than decentralize, the cliques will become more independent entities with more power in the gang structure, and the gangs will be weakened but not eliminated from society, as the current mass incarceration resembles 2004, when the gangs cultivated a strong structure during their time in prison. She found, as an example, evidence from El Faro, which suggests that local communities are still putting money aside for when they believe the gangs will resume collection. In her conclusion, Nora argues that to prevent the gangs from growing in strength following the state of exception, there should be a focus on bridging the government's influence in local communities. Thus far, the central government has lacked the ability to reach the rural communities, but with the gangs in a weakened condition, there is a window of opportunity for President Bukele to effectively distribute resources to strengthen the government's influence and legitimacy in the local municipalities. With that, I will turn it over to my next colleague. Well, thank you, Willa, for that wonderful introduction. And I will say, you're gonna hear, your, hear some similar themes as we go through all of our papers today. So uh, thank you for that. Well, my name is Grant Anderla. Uh, I am presenting on behalf of Asmund Jodal, Lucy Bales, and Abby McCarter. Our papers each focus on efforts at peacemaking with gangs and the associated challenges. We each cover different qualities of peacemaking processes and how they apply to El Salvador. We note that attempting to establish and maintain peace with gangs faces challenges as one would expect given that gangs are generally apolitical and therefore fall outside of spaces to achieve de-escalation through negotiation or democratic inclusion with governments. The gang's use of violence and other crimes such as extortion drive the separation between themselves and civil society but likewise their general goals shift them away from political processes. Three commonalities inform our arguments. First, there is an intense lack of trust among the government, gangs, and civil society, making it incredibly challenging to transform the relationship toward a more civilized and negotiation-worthy process. Second, we note that governments facing gang violence are not incentivized to transform policies from traditional law enforcement and security approaches Rather, they are incentivized to continue punitive measures to respond to gangs, given public discourse and the lack of trust built into the histories of violence and conflict. Third, the future opportunities for accommodative approaches to prevent further gang conflict will become increasingly challenging without strategic planning, the inclusion of convincing incentives, and transformation of public perspectives on gangs and their relations to civil society. With this background in mind, I will turn to our individual papers. Starting with Abby's paper, she examines how a desire for popularity can drive leaders toward escalatory policies and ultimately limit a leader's options for effective conflict management. Abby explains how popularity serves as an incentive for conflict resolution escalation. She outlines that psychological research demonstrates that vengeance-based policies align with human intuitions of justice 
leading the public to perceive these as the best policies for responding to violent groups. Abby also discusses framing of in-groups versus out-groups, which enforces separation and othering. This involves the framing of an opposition party, invoking an us versus them mentality, which appeals to voters and can be useful in rallying support. Many voters also equate punitive or escalatory policies with strength, which can benefit certain political leaders uh, in the proper context. President Bukele, Abby argues, benefits from El Salvador's conceptions of justice and uses these divisions between the general public and gangs to achieve high levels of public approval, evidenced by his historic popularity in El Salvador with approval ratings uh, around 90%. Abby's research indicates that popularity can serve as a limiting factor, however. Given the benefit of these policies for popularity, de-escalation of the policies would be politically damaging for the government. As such, popularity acts as both an incentive driving escalation and a limiting factor which prevents de-escalation. Part of the challenge is that President Bukele faces the dual challenge of sunk costs and tied hands, uh, which further positions the government to continue with these escalatory policies. One example of these uh, sunk costs is the large investment into building one of the world's largest prisons and the largest prison in Latin America. Additionally, she argues that President Bukele has tied his hands uh, by public publicly committing to a future of punitive policies in response to gang violence. Despite the administration's uh, facing high financial costs, costs in their international standing, and costs in terms of social cohesion, given the high number of arrests and potential impact at the community level, the cost of vengeance vengeance-based policies are not seemingly worse than the value of popularity achieved through these escalatory policies. Thus, she suggests that unless the president experiences some uh, form of major political backlash, there will be no incentive to risk the escalatory policies toward gangs. Moving next to Lucy Bales' paper, she looks at ceasefires, not just as one-off instances of breaks in violence, but rather as ongoing and iterative processes that shape the conflict and future peacebuilding contexts. Lucy's analysis of the negotiation literature identifies that repeated attempts at failed negotiations make it harder to achieve a negotiated settlement in the future. And she applies this thinking in the context of El Salvador, uh, given the long history of ceasefires uh, with gangs and looks at the long-term impacts of utilizing these ceasefires specifically in this criminal context. She finds that the use of successive ceasefires without strong commitment to the long-term processes erodes public trust in both the government as a whole, given the public may feel that the government does not have their best interests in mind and cannot secure a more beneficial outcome than continued conflict through that ceasefire. And it breaks trust in future ceasefire approaches altogether, showing the public that ceasefires themselves cannot provide a better outcome than the continued conflict or confrontation. In the criminal context in particular, the public trust necessary for an effective ceasefire is already much more fragile, given the controversy of any engagement with gang members or extremely violent groups. So Lucy finds that this trust is easily eroded in criminal context through these repeated and failed ceasefire processes. In El Salvador specifically, we see that there were various ceasefire attempts before 2019, most notably with the 2012 truce established under the Funes government. But there were also other instances of negotiation and short-term ceasefires between 2012 and 2019. Several limitations drove the 2012 truce to fail, including the agreement's inability to address key concerns of the public alongside the lack of commitment by all sides uh, of the agreement's outcomes. Following the failure of that truce, public trust and belief in the value of ceasefires only continued to diminish as repeated attempts failed, creating a cycle of public fatigue with ceasefire approaches and uh, fueling perceptions of gang truces as tools of corruption rather than a tool for real peace building. The current state of exception has leveraged this context, says Lucy, by taking a new approach to gang violence, in part by building on public fatigue and perceived corruption of past administration's approaches that failed to really solve these problems. In this way, the state of exception has also been made, uh, been able to uh, build significant public trust by effectively solving the long-term insecurity caused by gangs that ceasefires have failed to address. So going forward, 
Returning to a ceasefire or other negotiated approach will be challenging as repeated ceasefires have changed the peace building context. For now, it seems that El Salvador has chosen a path of continued confrontation through the state of exception and the security benefits that this approach has brought. Asman's paper begins with an understanding that while the handling of criminal gangs is generally left to law enforcement, there appears to be an opportunity for outside actors to assist in tackling criminal networks through non-confrontational approaches. His research seeks to draw attention to the limits of mediation specifically, focusing on the limits of the United Nations in mediating within emerging conflicts. Asman outlines some of the limitations that the United Nations faces, especially in peacemaking and mediation efforts related to gang violence. In the field of conflict management, scholars have been, become increasingly wary and have lost faith uh, in the organization's mediation efforts. One of the main points of contention in international mediation that he highlights is the debate over whether it, it is within the UN's mandate to mediate these types of conflicts with criminal groups. His discussion on the topic showcases that the UN's authority in such conflicts is a gray zone, which makes mediation very difficult to begin. While there is some risk of spillover effect of gangs into other countries, which would perhaps invite the UN, there is no precedent for the UN to mediate uh, directly with gangs as they are not inherently ideological groups. Asmund also seeks to explain why the UN is unlikely to successfully mediate an agreement between the Salv Salvadoran government and Salvadoran gangs. Firstly, the Bukele administration views a war with gangs as nearly one, thus the government lacks the incentive to ask for outside assistance to mediate uh, the conflict. In its view, by continuing the state of exception, gangs are being dismantled and will ultimately be imprisoned or fully removed from society, reducing the need for mediation efforts. Second, Asman notes that President Bukele's relationship with international community members, critical of his policies, uh, is characterized by tensions, which prevents an interest in support for mediation from these parties, especially emphasizing concerns about human rights abuses toward imprisoned individuals. Asman also reminds us that Mediating in El Salvador has been difficult for mediating organizations. For instance, the Organization of American States faced criticism as a consequence of its failed uh, mediation attempts of a truce in 2012 and 2013. Given these failures, the United Nations is also wary to risk mediation efforts in El Salvador, as the organization's overall goal remains to preserve the relationship with the government. Finally, Asman discusses two weaknesses of mediating. First, he notes that the general lack of an identifiable negotiating partner within the gangs makes it hard to determine who to mediate between. And second, he suggests that the government perceives that mediation efforts would ultimately damage the war with gangs uh, agenda and weaken the government's political capital as mediators would be viewed as helping gangs. Therefore, there is little incentive for the Bukele administration to invite the UN to mediate the ongoing conflict. And finally, my paper uh, stems from an understanding that gang negotiations have been used in several countries facing extreme gang violence. In most cases, negotiation processes, whether by invoking ceasefires or utilizing mediation tactics, have largely failed to produce long-term reductions in violence. I argue that one explanation for negotiations failure stems from a conflict management concept called an enticing opportunity or a unilateral perception of a way out of conflict which departs from negotiation. I explored the concept called the mutually enticing opportunity to start which motivates negotiating partners to depart from conflict through a negotiation where the two parties identify mutual interests and shared goals. I argue that negotiations with gangs often fail because they are missing the mutuality of this mutually enticing opportunity and suggest that governments pursue conflict resolution through the enticing opportunity characterized by unilateralism, separation, and othering. These opportunities for conflict transformation stem from a turning point such as a crisis and leads to escalatory policies. In the case of El Salvador, the introduction of the state of exception emerged out of one such enticing opportunity following the breakdown of a supposed agreement in March of 2022. The government appeared to negotiate with gangs up to this time when the agreement broke down, prompting the government's response with the state of exception. With this enticing opportunity came the unilateral solution for reducing violence in the country at the cost of certain constitutional rights. 
However, the theory of the enticing opportunity argues this unilateral policy transformation risks the weakening of future engagement opportunities with former gang members and risks long-term instability of negotiation. The conflict management literature generally argues that negotiations, which do not include mutual decision-making and shared interests, fail to produce sustainable peace because they ignore opposition interests and often lead to exclusionary policies. The enticing opportunity theory serves to expand on this understanding, arguing that it is the lack of mutuality which prevents both sides from seeing a way out of conflict and fails to motivate continued negotiations between conflicting parties. Enticing opportunities for unilateral policies are informed by framing of opposition and lack of incentives for relational transformation. Enticing opportunities of the past have driven negotiations, but risk unsustainable outcomes because of that lack of mutual understanding and interdependence informed throughout the negotiation process and motivated by mutually discovered outcomes. Negotiations with gangs in the past have failed to produce sustainable outcomes because they do not emphasize mutuality, but rather emphasize unilateral policy transformation to achieve resolution. So despite enticing opportunities in forming policies in El Salvador, there is a potential, in my view, to transform the current enticing opportunities into mutual opportunities if efforts towards reframing and negotiation are introduced. These efforts could come from identifying opportunities for transformation of relations with demobilized gang members in favor of re or to move towards rehabilitation and reinsertion into communities following a legal negotiation process with former gang members. As I've illustrated through these papers, the failure to produce peacemaking is complex and explained by a variety of relational factors, which are difficult for governments to change quickly. However, continued efforts to use coercive and escalatory policies risk long-term violence, and there may be alternative set strategies to induce relational transformation through trust building and continued engagement. Thank you to everybody joining for today's presentation. My name is Salman Hussain, and I have the pleasure of presenting on behalf of my colleagues, Aydin Ulu, Maggie Hai, and Shannon Burton. Through our presentations, my group will explore topics that unpack insights into the challenges and opportunities for achieving durable peace in El Salvador. We'll begin with uh, our presentation with my topic on civilian self-protection and resilience building. Then we'll turn to Aydin's topic on retributive justice, Next, we'll explore Maggie's uh, topic on applying the Women, Peace, and Security Framework to El Salvador. And finally, we'll conclude with Shannon's gender analysis of reintegration programming. Within the umbrella of durable peace, we examine common themes that resonate across our distinct topics. Collectively, our papers emphasize certain common themes, uh, such as the pervasive impact of violence on communities, the potential to break cycles of violence and achieve conflict transformation, the importance of applying a gender lens to conflict analysis, the importance of recognizing the unique roles of women within El Salvador, and of course, the criticality of community empowerment. What's really central to our analysis is the emphasis on civilian decision-making and human agency as a crucial aspect of conflict management and the need to strengthen this in order for robust solutions to emerge. Ultimately, our topics converge under the framework of durable peace in El Salvador, by addressing these themes that I've mentioned, we aim to contribute to a more multifaceted understanding of conflict management that can foster lasting peace and prosperity for Salvadorans. With that, I'll turn to our first topic. My analysis explores the notion of civilian self-protection in vulnerable communities under gang rule prior to the state of exception. In this context, self-protection refers to the ability of civilians to pursue strategies to avoid, mitigate, or thwart violence by armed groups. Despite being disempowered and lacking external sources of protection for decades under gang domination, Salvadoran communities have actively engaged in practices to maximize their protection and mitigate violence, suggesting that they are in no way passive actors. In the face of limited alternatives and high costs of resistance to gang authority, Salvadoran communities have developed specific self-protection measures that prioritize their daily basic survival. In my paper, I proposed a typology of self-protection practices in, in the Salvadoran context, which you can see summarized in this graphic slide. 
Many of these survival-driven coping mechanisms addressed immediate protection needs of vulnerable Salvadorians, but they also generated harmful trade-offs that undermined their long-term resilience to conflict. Under gang rule, communities became entrapped in a collective survival mode, hindering their capacity to invest in their community's development and to control their own destinies. My analysis of self-protection reveals fragmented social relations, limited collective organizational capacities, and constrained civilian agency. While there have been significant reductions in the levels of gang violence under the Bukele administration's state of exception, it is premature to declare a durable victory over gangs. The persistence of conflict drivers and many of the societal conditions that enabled gangs to flourish in the first place demand our continued attention. So resilience is extremely crucial in this context because it not only allows us to understand the ability of communities to respond to existing adversity and long-term stressors, but also their capacity to respond to future adversity, such as the reconstitution of gang power or new manifestations of conflict that may occur down the line. So my analysis highlights several key lessons learned for duty bearers seeking to reinforce resilience to potential new sources of conflict. Firstly, mapping and measuring resilience is essential to assessing the impact of resilience building interventions. So developing standardized indicators that measure tangible elements of community resilience, establishing a baseline of analysis, and then consistently collecting evidence over time will be really essential. Secondly, empowering communities requires meaningful engagement with marginalized populations, such as women, adolescent youth, ethnic minorities, and LGBTQI plus individuals. Their participations and perspectives in resilience building initiatives must be prioritized to ensure inclusive efforts that are sufficiently contextualized to local situations. And lastly, while resilience discourse emphasizes inherent community capacities, the state has a crucial protection role to fulfill. Going beyond a pure hard security framework, the government must strengthen the community capacities to respond effectively to future conflicts in, in collaboration with affected populations, civil society groups, and local governance structures. As we explore the multifaceted issue of conflict management in El Salvador, it's crucial to delve into the realm of transitional justice, which Iden's paper touches upon. Iden's paper asserts that a unique mix of societal conditions, uh, including the violence normative environment, the marginalized status of gangs, and their deeply entrenched presence in impoverished communities has fostered a pervasive desire for revenge among the public. Given the severity of this situation, Iden argues for the implementation of a retributive justice as a critical component of transitional justice. This offers an alternative to the binary choice between vengeance and forgiveness. Retributive justice grounded in principles of proportionality and commensurateness can effectively address the societal conditions and prevailing endorsement of vengeance in El Salvador. By ensuring that punishments align with the gravity of crimes committed, retributive justice could help validate the public sense of victimization, restore their dignity, and prevent excessive punishments that often result from revenge-based measures against gang members. His paper further argues that retributive justice can help establish a legitimate just desert perception among the public, respecting due process while also addressing past wrongdoings and injustices inflicted by gangs. This rests on the argument that the state has a moral obligation to hold offenders responsible and to punish them when appropriate. This provides a satisfactory public recognition of the wrongs done to victims, which affirms their dignity and equality, and also vindicates their status as rights holders. However, transitioning from a vengeance-oriented system to one of retributive justice will require significant structural and cultural changes in the Salvadoran justice system. Iden's paper emphasizes the need to strengthen judicial independence, ensure proportionality in sentencing, safeguard due process rights, and foster transparency and accountability. By doing so, the government can restore public faith in the justice system and lay the groundwork for sustainable peace and social cohesion. Iden's paper ultimately underscores the potential of retributive justice and rectifying historical wrongdoings and forging a more equitable, fair, and trustworthy justice system in El Salvador. Building upon the importance of justice, we now turn our attention to the Women, Peace, and Security Index introduced in Maggie's paper. Leveraging the WPS Index, Maggie's analysis scrutinizes the nexus of gang violence and governmental responses in El Salvador. The WPS Index, a creation of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, and the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, embraces three categories, inclusion, justice, and security. Maggie's paper focuses on security, which includes intimate partner violence at the family level, community safety at the community level, and organized violence at the societal level. 
El Salvador grapples with pervasive gender-based violence. This is exacerbated by data scarcity and alleged omissions in governmental reporting on femicide rates and other manifestations of gender-based violence. Over half of Salvadoran women in intimate relationships have faced partner-inflicted violence. This disturbing trend persists despite high rates of gang member incarceration under the current state of exception. Locally, women's safety perceptions actually rose from 2017 to 2021, prior to the state of exception. After the state of exception, perceived safety may have increased, but data is still lacking. Interviews with civil society leaders suggest violence against women remains consistent, but this information is not adequately reported or reflected in official rates. Civil society plays a key role at the community level, fostering engagement and responsiveness to gender inequality, violence, and social exclusion under the WPS agenda. However, the threat of backlash from the Salvadoran government to civil society activity and advocacy in recent years has limited their abilities to contribute positively to conflict transformation. The Kubo's initiative that was previously referenced is a governmental effort at the community level, and it provides a safe haven for youth away from gang influence. This early stage initiative, despite substantial investment, still awaits an impact assessment, which will be crucial. The WPS index at the societal level has neglected to factor in criminal gang violence, rendering El Salvador's safety score inaccurately high for several years. So Maggie suggests that to reflect the actual security situation, the index should incorporate high levels of criminal gang activity as evident in El Salvador. According to Maggie's analysis, El Salvador's political institutions often, often superficially advocate for gender equality, achieving mere tokenism rather than substantial change. And genuine progress will require commitments to gender mainstreaming and challenging deep-rooted norms that perpetuate disparities at various levels. A more comprehensive gender-sensitive approach to security could advance the WPS agenda, fostering a safer, more equitable society in El Salvador. Continuing our focus on gender, we now delve into the realm of reintegration and the significance of a gender-sensitive approach, which Shannon's paper articulates. Although Salvadorian gangs are seen as criminal groups that do not hold an ideology, they have controlled more territory than the average street gang and have been legitimized by negotiations with previous governments. Given this kind of gray zone that these actors fall into, Shannon advocates for a combination of gender sensitive disarmament, demobilization and reintegration or DDR and de-radicalization, disengagement and reintegration or DDP to address their entrenched social position in the Salvadoran context. To do this, Shannon's paper uses a gender analysis framework that's typically used for DDR programming and emphasizes two primary elements. First, prioritizing parallel programs and funding for women. And second, demilitarizing masculinities among ex-combatants. By applying this analysis, Shannon was able to identify that during the disengagement process, reconstructing masculinities can serve as a powerful tool in breaking the connection between violence and a gang member's identity. This is particularly important for gang members that might be eligible for reintegration. Research has shown that during a former combatant's transition back into civilian life, they can struggle with the change in their identity and other situational factors. Within this context, we often find that ex-combatants resort to domestic violence as a way to exert control over their uncertain situation. Shannon argues that community leaders should have input in designing gender-inclusive reintegration programs. These programs will need to be careful not to reinforce traditional gender labor divisions, because not only can this alienate ex-gang uh, members who are females who might have uh, adapted a, adopted excuse me, a fighter identity, but it also perpetuates gender stereotypes that male gang members use in relation to their female relatives. A gender approach must therefore be centered in other community outreach programs. For example, research has demonstrated that restorative integration processes, which build on restorative justice principles of bringing victims and offenders together while the offender is still in prison, can help combatants sustainably disengage from criminal groups. However, typically these processes are focused on public crimes to the exclusion of gender-based violence and other forms of domestic violence. By addressing gender-based violence that may not typically be classified as gang-related crime, community organizations that are facilitate, facilitating these projects can address the contributing factors that lead to the offender's violence while also providing the victim an opportunity to process the impact that it has had on them. Examining the potential reintegration of former gang members from a gender lens thus helps identify lessons across both DDR and DDP frameworks that can prepare former gang members as well as the communities for post-gang El Salvador. 
Gender programming can aid both men and women gang members to recognize how they can disaffiliate their identities from violence. Additionally, through gender-centered processes, these reintegration programs can expand their outreach to directly include affected communities by tackling both private and public manifestations of violence. Returning to our theme of durable peace, our collective exploration of conflict management in El Salvador sheds light on the intricate web of challenges posed by gang violence. Collectively, we've advocated for sustainable resilience building informed by self-protection, retributive justice mechanisms grounded in proportionality, uh, application of the women, peace, and security framework to address gender-based violence, and the implementation of a gender-sensitive approach to reintegration for former gang members. By embracing a durable peace framework, one that tackles root causes of conflict, fosters inclusivity, we aim to envision a brighter future in El Salvador where communities thrive and individuals can realize their true potential. Hello, my name is Mary Hopkins, and I will be presenting our final group of papers, which revolve around the impact of governance on the population under intrastate conflict. To start, I'll be presenting my own research, which specifically focuses on populist style leadership and its impact on peace building. Cass Moody defines contemporary populism as an ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into two homogenous and antagonistic groups the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and it argues that politics should be an expression of the general will of the people. The two main elements of populism are relevant to our discussion today, the apolitical nature of populist appeal and the transferability of populist rhetoric. The appeal of populism today is rooted in the frustrations of the apolitical silent majority with democracy. In fact, populism is appealing, because, especially to apolitical citizens, because it prioritizes effectiveness and results-based leadership over the preservation of participatory democracy, which many in the silent majority believe does not represent the true interests of the people, but is rather subordinate to the will of the corrupt elite. Moreover, populism is a, quote, thin-centered ideology, according to Murray unique from other types of political isms in that it is not tied to a particular doctrine. Rather, it is widely appealing due to its generalizable power versus the underdog type of rhetoric. The widespread applicability of populism means it can manifest and gain significant political traction in virtually any context, which can be dangerous in cases where it intersects with ongoing social conflicts and armed violence. Specifically, I focus on punitive populism, a, a subgenre of populism writ large, which is a type of political discourse in democratic societies that politicizes policymaking around criminality in favor of retributive, short-term punitive measures for the sake of appeasing the general will. In punitive populist rhetoric, criminality is the primary source of social conflict, or at least the largest barrier between the people and the resolution of their needs. This strategic framing of the criminal act as a threat to the livelihood of the state and its people as well as the source of widespread conflict and discontent, enables, justifies, and encourages the weaponization of the state security apparatus against the enemy of the state, the perpetrators of the crime. In cases of interstate conflicts that challenge state power, domestic peace building processes typically include features of both liberal and local paradigms, as defined by uh, expert Subedi. Liberal peace building, quote, seeks to build peace through rebuilding liberal democratic institutions and revitalizing the capitalist and liberal market economy, while local peace building seeks to recognize and respect local contextual and cultural differences while striving to identify local peace promoting factors and to promote local institutions ownership and capacities that can resolve differences nonviolently. Prior research studied by Subedi um, on how populism impacts peace building interstate conflict uses a particular framework that I apply to study the impact of punitive populism specifically on peace building in the case of El Salvador. Specifically, I analyze the contextuality or the circumstance from which populist leadership emerges, the substantiality or the impact on issues significant to long-term peace building and the practicality or the actual conflict related initiative put forth by the government um, to understand the impact of populism on peace building specifically and democracy. I've also sub uh, I've supplemented this with public opinion data that points to a demonstrated punitiveness amongst Salvadorians. 
And ultimately, my findings suggested that as with populism writ large, sustainable, positive peace building is directly challenged by populist government governance in favor of short-term results. And this challenge includes the introduction of anti-democratic reforms that thwart liberal and participatory democracy long-term. Moreover, it demonstrates that liberal and local peace building and populist regimes is thwarted not only by leadership, but by the people themselves and their preferences for non-participation in politics, effective liberalism over participatory and liberal democracy and short-term results over long-term investments and initiatives. This next paper uh, digs a little deeper into a specific population and looks at how conflict and governance impact the mental health of a uniquely vulnerable population, internally displaced people. IDPs are persons who have been forced to flee as a result of armed conflict, situations of generalized violence, and who have not crossed an internationally recognized state border. So unlike refugees, IDPs remain under the protection of their own government and therefore are their responsibility. In El Salvador, almost 2 million internal displacements due to gang violence have occurred since 2014. And in 2022, there are uh, an estimated 114,400 IDPs in the country many of whom who had been displaced more than once. The environment of gang violence has significantly increased the risk of developing mental disorders and has had severe consequences on the ability of these people to live a normal existence. This silent wave of displacement is difficult to observe precisely because of the continuing fear suffered by victims of gang violence induced displacement. In addition, since the declaration of the state of exception in March, 2022, an additional dynamic affecting forced displacement flows within the country has emerged, fear of the state and its security apparatus. Given the substantial research gap on the issue, Joshua sought to highlight the necessity of creating new avenues for the protection of these vulnerable groups. The abrupt and coerced displacement of IDPs fleeing gang violence in El Salvador is one of the harshest multiple loss experiences imaginable. And it's important to note that the brutality faced by these displaced persons does not end with displacement, but rather that these populations become even more vulnerable with detrimental consequences for their mental health. Sources of potential harm can include family breakup, loss of friendships and social networks, lack of opportunities, real or perceived, and the general trauma of displacement and the events leading up to it. This creates a general context of threat uncertainty, deprivation, oppression, and suffering. Ultimately, the findings um, of Joshua concluded that internal displacement has significant consequences for mental well-being because of two interrelated characteristics, confinement and instability. Where possible, IDPs seek support from family or friends. However, in most cases, this is not possible out of fear of being identified by violent criminals and even state authorities. As a result of this, IDPs are forced to move between places while simultaneously being confined, two factors that result in the near cessation of all normal day-to-day -day activities. The contextual mechanisms of confinement and instability drastically affect five key areas of an IDP's life, work, education, living standard, family, and healthcare access. These in turn have significant effects on individual, family, and community mental well-being. In addition, the additional dynamic of the state of exception um, has enhanced these challenges with the harassment of witnesses, the refusal to investigate crime, et cetera, which all compounds the experiences of victimization and suffering among IDPs. In conclusion, Joshua argues that the only way to effectively mitigate the severe mental health effects faced by IDPs is through sustained and transparent collaboration between the Salvadorian government and civil society groups. There's also an incentive for the international community to international community to respond as providing better IDP support domestically is likely to stem outward migratory flows to Mexico, the United States, and elsewhere. Addressing the pressing mental health concerns of IDPs requires a more robust international protection framework that can be dependent on when national governments fail to uphold their responsibility to provide assistance. While it is unlikely that the phenomenon of international internal displacement in El Salvador will cease in the foreseeable future, possibility of a more intersectional approach between conflict management and public health provides hope that the mental consequences for thousands of displaced individuals present and future will be alleviated. This next paper looks at the way in which an anocratic government, so not a democratic and not an authoritarian government, but one that has features of both, um, communicates state narratives in a conflict situation in the digital age. For some context, Bukele enjoys widespread popularity with an 86% approval rating in El Salvador, making him the most popular leader in the region and globally. 
However, since 2021, independent, independent media and civil society organizations in El Salvador and abroad have claimed that Bukele is using propaganda and disinformation to deceive people. Denise's paper argues that a combination of online gray propaganda and disinformation is being used as a tool to create a perception of democracy in post-conflict countries while allowing political elites to consolidate power with limited resistance. This paper uses El Salvador as a case study to investigate how populist autocratic leaders like Bukele capture political power in the digital age and examines its consequences. The two main concepts being dealt with here are gray propaganda, which combines accurate and inaccurate content and sourcing information, as well as disinformation. Propaganda is distinct from disinformation in that the former proposes alternative narratives using both true and false information while the latter uses false information. The leading accusations against the use of disinformation and propaganda in El Salvador include a lack of transparency about the security situation. Uh, in particular, reports have confirmed the tendency of Bukele's government to hide a good part of the murders committed to justify the continuation of the state of emergency. Also, um, another uh, major concern is the delegitimization of independent media and civil society organizations. Since coming to power, Bukele has added an alternative, an alternate version of reality, according to which he is the sole defender of the people against what he calls los mismos, los mismos que siempre, which translates from Spanish to the same ones as always. Finally, Bukele has also used uh, great propaganda and disinformation to effectively try and rewrite El Salvador's history. He has repeatedly called the 12 year long civil war and the peace accords that ended them a farce. This is problematic because the peace accords are responsible for the current institutional architecture and constitution in El Salvador. And Bukele's narrative of calling the peace agreement a farce provides him the justification to dismantle it. Bukele is often known for having one of the most sophisticated political advertising campaigns. This paper identifies two main reasons for why this online strategy has worked for Bukele as compared to other political elites. These include a carefully constructed online populist image, which created the ideal com conditions for disinformation and propaganda to be effective, as well as a twofold digital communication strategy, which is public but not transparent and intentional but not impulsive. Being public does not necessarily guarantee transparency. Social media in particular provides the ideal platform to spread propaganda and disinformation because it creates the illusion of direct two-way communication with the people, which, it, which in reality, it is one way. This is seen in Bukele's reservation in giving interviews or conducting press conferences. In addition, Bukele is often compared to Donald Trump for being a nighttime tweeter, but this comparison undermines how sophisticated Bukele's political branding efforts are. He uses a religious rhetoric, um, as well as a strategy of information overload, as well, and his press office has control over all the public accounts of all officials in the government. The current messaging is problematic because it normalizes the use of gray propaganda and disinformation. It is currently concealing corruption, as Bukele and his administration have repeatedly been accused of not only misusing pandemic funds, but also protecting corrupt individuals working for his administration, as well as self-censorship. Self Journalists and civil society organizations are practicing self-censorship, censorship, and it is only a matter of time that the wider public moves into self-censorship if it has not already been, begun being practiced in El Salvador. This is important to interpreting public opinion polls. The polls do not provide a reason to judge success. Rather, they show how many people receive Bukele's signal. Finally, it conceals a slowdown in results. While there are questions about the sustainability of Bukele's policies on the gang crackdown, there are more questions around whether Bukele can deliver on all his other promises, such as increasing employment and education opportunities for Salvadorians, among others. Looking forward, uh, Danita argues for why this matters in the context of what's coming. On the domestic front, the next presidential elections in El Salvador will take place in 2024. Bukele stands to be reelected for a second term, and almost 3 million Salvadorian refugees living in the United States will be allowed to partake in these elections. Propaganda and disinformation often surge around election time. So her study aims to caution Salvadorians if their right to, to access public information is being compromised. On the regional front, El Salvador is increasingly being viewed as the best model to address gang violence, and it is likely that neighboring countries in the region are likely to adopt Bukele's deceitful communication strategies to control the narrative. And on the international front, 
a controlled narrative could pose a threat to diplomatic relations, international trade, and foreign aid disbursement. Finally, to close, I'll be discussing the work of my colleague on a possible alternative approach to security in El Salvador. The question of how states should pursue security and consider human rights and justice to resolve conflict and produce peace is subject to intense debate. Their interaction between these concepts becomes particularly complex when countries face prolonged periods of violence. El Salvador is a poignant example of a country that has long struggled to break a cycle of deadly violence and sought to resolve it through a public security approach. The preeminence of this country's heavy-handed approach to tackle domestic insecurity makes it a useful case study to examine both the merits and limitations of the public security model, and also to look at the opportunities that alternative models offer, namely that of human security and its ability to integrate the concept of human rights and comprehensive forms of justice. Doris's paper demonstrates that a human security model enables governments experiencing conflict to expand their conceptualization of what security means in relation to human rights, justice, and the pursuit of peace. Consequently, this can yield more comprehensive results in each of these individual components. Security can both serve to enable human rights and vice versa. The conjunction of security and justice leads to procedural justice, and ultimately a comprehensive human security model can lead to durable peace. The two central concepts discussed are public security and human security, and their specific relationship with human rights and justice are explored by yours throughout. Public security is a traditional form of state security, premised on a government's responsibility to ensure the safety of its citizens from physical harm. While all, all governments apply public security solutions to deal with crime in cases where non-state actors significantly jeopardize the authority of the state and its monopoly on violence, public security takes on a special significance, as has been the case with El Salvador. Given the narrow mandate of public security to ensure physical security of its people, this model may neglect human rights for portions of the population. This dichotomous interaction specifically materializes when a government views the concept of human rights in zero-sum or finite terms. This does not necessarily imply a wholesale rejection of human rights in relation to security. Rather, it suggests that through a public security prism, the state views the concept of human rights selectively. Public security is also positively linked to a particular form of justice, namely that of punitive justice, which refers to a state's emphasis on punishment as a way to manufacture accountability and deterrence. Over the past several decades, the meaning of security has expanded beyond its traditional conceptions. The most comprehensive security framework is encompassed through human security, which has the potential to address the inherent deficits of traditional public security approaches by integrating human rights as well as expanded versions of justice. Fundamentally, the human security framework aspires to secure a person's freedoms from want, from, from fear, and freedom to live in dignity. The strength of a human security-based approach is that it can converge both human rights and different types of justice with public, public security mechanisms. For example, it adheres to the viewpoint that human rights can directly enable security as well as view that Human rights is a form of security in and of itself, and the state therefore has an obligation to refrain from infringing upon it. Oftentimes, discussion on the relationship between security and human rights are premised on the notion that they are impatible concepts. Uh, Yoris aims to highlight that this is a false choice and that a government can both implement public security instruments as long as they are complemented by human security focused approaches. First, the utilization of public and human security approaches do not necessarily contradict. And if human rights and due process are considered in public security, there can be ways to bring them together in harmony. Second, it is important to recognize the different perspectives and priorities between domestic and international actors. For example, whereas El Salvador is focused on individuals that need to be protected from human rights violations by those outside the state, the international community is concerned about human rights infractions committed by the state. In the pursuit of peace, both elements should be considered. Another area of convergence to incorporate both security models is their shared objectives to strengthen the justice system, which ultimately means both ensuring that once someone is apprehended, criminals are appropriately convicted, while also making sure innocent civilians are freed. Finally, a central objective in conflict management is determining what role international actors can play in facilitating a path towards peace. In the case of El Salvador, for example, it finds that it can build on the, pre the precedent cooperative programs within the UN Human Security Unit. While physical security mechanisms are important to maintain order and address harmful deficits of a government's monopoly over violence, 
a state securitization should not expand its emergency mandates to wield excessive power or impede on civil liberties and judicial independence. Security and justice can positively reinforce each other if they are conjoined in a way that advances durable peace, namely through the integration of procedural and restorative justice. Thank you. All right, so thank you to our presenters. I'd like to call you now uh, to join us uh, at, the, at the table uh, for the remaining 40-ish minutes that we have at our disposal to address any questions and comments, suggestions from the audiences both here and on Zoom. And I would like to invite our Zoom audience also to uh, 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 bring forward any question or comment that they uh, deem uh, uh, useful. So. Uh, here in the room, we have a microphone, but because of the uh, format in which we're taking this uh, uh, presentation, it may, may be necessary that if the question is addressed to a specific paper, that the author of the paper comes to the podium and, and answers that question. The panel should take on questions that share uh, the idea throughout the subgroups that you've been uh, talking on behalf. So you maintain your spokesperson role uh, throughout, uh, throughout the session. All right, so I would like to open the floor for, uh, for questions from the audience, please. Gentlemen. If you don't mind, present yourself and, and, and direct the question accordingly. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. My name is Chetan. I'm a second year student at SAIS. I had a question about a topic that wasn't explicitly touched on here, but is part of the broader crackdown on gangs, which is the adoption of Bitcoin as a legal tender in El Salvador, which is you know a, a currency that is actually preferred by transnational terror groups, organized crime. Uh, so on the one hand, using extrajudicial methods to tamp down on violence, you know, is, is one tactic. On the other hand, they're opening up another avenue for money laundering, you know, illicit finance. I'm curious about the discussions among civil society in the country and people that you talk to. Is, is, it, is the adoption of Bitcoin exacerbating the problem? Does it have anything to do with the state of exception and the attempt to crack down on gang violence? Or are the two entirely unrelated? I can take this to start, but please feel free to jump in. My understanding actually was that coming from the states, we talked about Bitcoin so much more than anyone we talked to in El Salvador talked about Bitcoin. And in fact, uh, primarily El Salvador remains a significantly cash-based society. Um, it was virtually, I mean, oh, oh sorry, is it not? Yes. Okay, sorry, my bad. Um, it was it was almost a, a non-concern, especially because I think there was this perception that the gangs were more advanced. Um, but in reality, the gangs operate in a very like the way extortion always worked was in, in a very you know, it, it was based on what the person that they were extorting could do. And so, if they're working with a cash-based society and they're working with people that make five dollars a day they're extorting two dollars from them as they leave the territory two dollars as they come back in cash right so when you, extortion is your primary model of gaining money as it gen, tends to be for the gangs in el salvador um bitcoin did not really become a major it hasn't at this point to my knowledge because it hasn't been adopted broadly in el salvador it hasn't become a a major um, facilitator. I think moving forward, because we're seeing this kind of transformation of the conflict on the ground, um, there is an opportunity if the gangs become more involved in maybe money laundering or in, involved with cartels or something like that, maybe we could see um, that kind of initiative. But the way that the gangs work is not, you know, it doesn't really work with them with, with that right now. So that's my understanding of it, though. Yeah, I would add that I think the uh, the use of Bitcoin for money laundering purposes is actually, I think, pretty, it's a challenging process to even launder money through Bitcoin, given the technology. Um, and I don't think that gangs have, um, you know, they haven't used cryptocurrency a lot to their benefit, as as Mary was stating. And so I think there's, I think there is a concern that, you know, other transnational criminal groups could come in 
and use El Salvador's uh, digital space as it's expanding for that purpose. But I think from the gang crackdowns specifically and the state of exception, I don't think it's informed uh, primarily or in a major part by that relationship with Bitcoin. I, I think it's a good question because it allows us the opportunity to show how distinct these criminal gangs, specifically in El Salvador, are in relation to other armed actors in terms of their financial structure. I mean, just to emphasize the point that Mary was making, the vast majority of their financial um, sustenance comes from extortion. And so it's interesting to consider how they may seek to adapt to the current situation, but despite their transnational nature, they've been extremely reliant on local populations. Um, and, and there's a, a mutual kind of dependency because of that. Thank you. Other questions, please? Professor Zartman. Very impressed. Let's wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. With what you all have done, and I feel dismal afterward, I mean, I, th I think you've shown uh, at every turn the logic of people doing what they're doing uh, and the, uh, the inexorable logic. Uh, so I was going to ask at some point early, uh, how do you get to negotiate with these people? But uh, I, you've shown clearly that you don't. Uh, and this last exchange, I think, pushes it one step further that uh, you, you, might, uh, you might become explicit about when you get to, to publish, to write it, write it up for publication. And that is El Salvador is gangs against gangs. The only thing is one gang is in power. Uh, and uh, it, it operates as, a, as, as, another, as another gang with the same kind of logic. Um, and I don't think there was anything in any of the presentations uh, that suggested a way out. I mean, when we talk to uh, mutually uh, uh, enticing opportunities, as I expected you would, uh, you didn't say anything about mutual hurting stalemates a step before uh, to accept uh, where you could just with one sentence show that it doesn't work. Uh, it's not a situation. There is no hurting stalemate here. And my only uh, uh, my only other comment is that I, I pity poor Mr. Joris, whoever he is. Uh, he must not have been on the trip uh, <laughs> because he's not talking about anything that uh, in any of the other papers show was was possible. But a very good presentation, but for for somewhere else on this earth. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I would throw out, I mean, the question that bugs me in all this is uh, how do you get them to negotiate? Um, uh, even just last comment, even the women's presentations, I mean, we're all inspired by the Irish women and, and uh, other women in other parts of the world uh, giving us some kind of hope, but the women's presentations show that in, in this society, uh, they're part of the gang. Uh, or they're well, re they're really victims of of being part of the gang. So, and any any light at the end of the tunnel? Yes, I think I think you're absolutely right that there appears to be, given the context of a history of violence since since long before the Civil War, El Salvador has a high tolerance for violence and punitive approaches to deal with those things. However, I think that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't get into the details of my paper, but I think that uh, there is an opportunity to transform the relationship with gangs following this ret retributive approach that was sort of outlined by a few different papers that by starting the process in a competition way to push for some version of a mutually hurting stalemate, you can drive gang the in my estimation there's the gangs that are in prison now are are seeking a way out or you know i think the the challenge of you know human rights abuses that is going on in prisons i think is pushing it would probably push these gang members to consider and there is a history of gang members wishing for an opportunity to transform their relationship to civil society through um, 
education, job transformation, and, and older members have indicated their interest in finding a way out for the young up and coming members of gangs who are 12, 13, and who maybe haven't participated in violence yet. So I think from our perspective, there's, there's a way to maybe focus on identifying those, those people who are not too far gone in the violent space and finding ways to invite them back into civil society um, through education, through uh, reinsertion, rehabilitation, and these things. So I think, I think there is an opportunity. And I think one of the biggest challenges that needs to be changed is negotiating with gangs is illegal by law but also by the international community there's no there's a lack of willingness to acknowledge that negotiation with gangs is an option including the united states the un so i think there needs to be a way to legalize a process and and make it publicly like publicly acknowledge it and i think that president bukele has an opportunity to maybe do that given his his popularity but um it's, it would take a lot of political will for him to, to make that choice. And I don't know that it doesn't seem that that's where he's going to go. So I think we're at a sort of a precipice where you could see de-escalation if, if the political will is there, but we don't necessarily perceive that it is. I also quickly want to come to yours, his defense really quickly. He was definitely on the trip and he got very sunburned, um, <laughs> the poor man. But I also want to take a little bit of the blame. I don't think I connected the themes within my group very well. And so I want to apologize for that. I think it's really, it's really, I think, easier to talk about the challenges and how things are definitely not going to work. And it's a lot harder and more challenging to talk about hope and opportunities for difference, for something different. Right. And I think what yours is offering is he was focusing on a model and you in, and a lot of times when we talk about models, it's like, oh, well, there's no way that's actually going to be realistically implementable, but that's not the point of a model. The point is, you know, looking towards the future, what is there an alternative? And I think that's the value of the human security approach is that yes, actually there is an alternative and things don't have to be black and white and the world is very complex. And this is a way of reframing thinking. And is it here? Is it going to work in the next year, two years? Is it going to work under Bekele? He's probably not very interested in that. But I, I don't think that, I think yours's paper was very forward thinking in that way. And I think it was a great way to end it out, um, closing on this idea of hope and, and the fact that there is a possibility for better in the future in El Salvador. Before I just quickly hand it over to Willa, I just wanted to say, I can't speak to the aspect of negotiations, but on the topic of resilience, um, I think we're really challenged by the lack of data, as Maggie pointed out in, in her presentation. Um, there are some case studies that show certain resilient uh, sub-communities within El Salvador that have managed to keep gangs at bay. They have higher levels of social cohesion. They're able to mobilize more effectively. They, they organize their own security. You know, They don't have better access to uh, local police or external sources of protection. So I think looking at some examples from within El Salvador, as well as Honduras, where we see also a gang context and other gang contexts like South Africa, America, Mozambique and Kenya were able to actually see certain civilian decision making and exercises of agency that are more effective than others in resisting the effects of gang violence. So I think hopefully putting some of the data together can help us inform resilience building interventions. But of course, there needs to be political capital from duty bearers to bring those into fruition. Yeah. And um, the last thing I would add, which I think Grant talked about a little bit, is that we didn't really see necessarily that there is an incentive for Bukele to participate in negotiations at this point. Um, the state of exception has demonstrated a lot of success. And you know, one way we saw that was that when we were there, we actually visited a Kubo in one of the previously the most dangerous communities in El Salvador. Um, and instead we spent the evening wandering around and talking with local children. And so I think when you look at the folks, you know, the, the Salvadorans that are living in these communities, this has been very successful and it would be potentially very politically costly for Bukele to participate in negotiations. So I think one of the things that at least I expect is that this will be the status quo for quite a long time until potentially he starts to face the financial costs of 70,000 folks in prison. Um, and, you know, that there's, if there is, if there is gang resiliency, as Nora talked about, um, 
is there kind of a new generation of gang members or is there not? And if there's not, then he may very well be quite happy to maintain the status quo. There may be no need to negotiate going forward. So I think we just really don't know at this point. Um, it's been a year under the state of exception. And what we've seen is a huge drop in homicide rates and extortion. And folks seem quite happy and content with where things are. So I think it's going to wait until there's financial pressure and potentially pressure from folks that have been wrongfully imprisoned and released. Beyond that, pressure from the international community doesn't seem to be very effective. Bukele has done a great job of positioning himself as standing up for El Salvador's position in the international system. Um, and he's able to deflect a lot of that criticism. So I think it's just, we're going to have to wait and see if there really is an opportunity or incentive for him to shift what he's doing right now. The gentleman in the back. Hello. Uh, my name is Francisco Maravilla. I'm from El Salvador. Um, I'm an artist and I do work for almost have years with young, with young people in my country in violence prevention programs with the Spanish embassy. And first I wanna say thank you guys for this uh, awesome uh, research and for do this uh, um, paper for uh, the people. I hope we can share this with a lot of people in our country because it's really, really necessary. And um, I have to do some comments, uh, two comments about the um, uh, negotiation. Uh, first, that um, do we have a background about negotiation in that and in, in, in a different conflicts as a country? Uh, at the world in the 80s, uh, United States sent $1 million daily to support military uh, to fight against the warfare. Yeah. Warfare, it was just farmers and union workers against um, military empowerment. So uh, United States and one million daily for maybe 10 years, 10 years um, to fight against the warfare. So Mexico and French uh, recognized uh, the, the, um, the farmers and the workers uh, and uh, recognize their cows as, as, a as a legitimate cows, and they support, both nations support uh, warfare, the FMLN, uh, to fight against the dictatorship at that moment. And then the United States just uh, was like uh, disappearing of the picture slowly, <laughs> and uh, the war had a consequence. The consequence was uh, a lot of people came from El Salvador to the United States throughout the 80s. Most part of the people lives here in DC. Most part of the people came with fake passports to the, to the country. And you know, uh, all the history is too long. But um, we, I, I didn't hear in all the presentation what you guys think is the role of the United States in the resolution of this conflict because they have a direct responsibility with what happened in El Salvador. And uh, that, that's the first question. And uh, the second one is, how can you, uh, how can we, can we imagine a process to, to do a negotiation with this group? Uh, we, we don't have any experience with, we, in, in, in our country, when we thought about this, um, we, we have some um, examples from Los, Los Angeles and uh, we know a lot of things about the, the um, Los Angeles situation. We know how um, the biggest gangs of Los Angeles, they, they, uh, they do a negotiation with the police and they do a negotiation between uh, all the gangs in LA. So what, 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 do you, what did you guys imagine uh, could be a possible uh, stage for negotiation in this case? Answer on the negotiations. Anyone want to chip in on the U.S. role? Because throughout the papers, there were some mentionings of it, other than Frank, who can be the spokesperson. Osman, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So on on the negotiation and what it looks like, I think that the I think that the um, the main thing would be. You know, in examples like the one you highlighted in Los Angeles, but also in, I think, Boston um, and in Boston has an example where police negotiated with gangs, uh, but also in, uh, in Ecuador, there's an example of, um, of the Latin kings being demobilized through negotiations with 
uh, with the government. And so there is there's a way to do it. I think that the challenge has been balancing the what peop, what public or what civil society at large expects from responses by governments towards gangs versus what is sort of the capacity of that of that gang to commit violence or do these things. So obviously uh, MS-13 and Barrio 18 have, have a higher propensity for violence and the ability to, to threaten and carry that out. Whereas, you know, each, each type of gang has its own purpose and its own sort of role in society. So for those that have been successful, demobilization has involved legalizing gangs in some circumstances, I think in, in Spain, in Norway, uh, they've made them sort of cultural or, I, or a, a specific group of people that serve that identity role that's very important to gangs. Um, but because they don't fulfill a political role in society beyond once they start gaining from things like ceasefires, they start identifying that they can use violence to push and pull um, and gain from, from negotiation. Uh, the expectations are still they they have an identi an identity they have um, the ability to gain concessions from governments and the government basically has to be willing to to provide some some concessions and where they've been successful it's been things like you know giving them legal status making sure that they are having opportunities beyond the gang life and put places where it hasn't worked have largely just been, you know, giving them a better situation in prison or, um, but not solving the root causes. So really it, it relies on solving root causes and focusing on the economic drivers um, and those, those factors of violence to, to successfully get gangs to demobilize and rejoin society. We have Asmund and Cameron who can talk about the U.S.'s role. Asmund? Then I saw a few more uh, questions there. there. Thank you. Sorry for pointing fingers. <laughs> Just to get direct. Thank you. So in terms of the U.S.'s role, um, the U.S. traditionally views uh, dealing with criminal gangs as a, uh, as a point of contention, and it's usually left to the law, uh, to law enforcement agencies, um, which is also the case here. Um, in addition, uh, the designation as of MS-13 as a terrorist organization makes it difficult for the U.S. to deal with deal with them, uh, both from the Treasury's designation, but also the local designation by the, uh, the Salvadoran government. Um, so what I tried to do was not only look at the U.S. role, which is, which is my main point uh, in the paper, but I tried to see if there was avenues for multi-party mediation meaning uh, several parties acting uh, together. Uh, if the US, UN, and the EU were able to pool their resources, they would, they would have severe political leverage. Um, they, would have, uh, they would be able to uh, um, pull a lot of funding uh, through aid programs and other things uh, that are still important to the Salvadoran government. Uh, so by threatening to do that, there might be some avenues for them to um, initiate negotiations uh, or a mediation process. Uh, but the US is not able to do it unilaterally. And at present, they also are not interested in uh, negotiating because they view it as a, uh, uh, they, they leave it up to law enforcement. Thank you, Cameron. Hi. Um, I can speak some to the U.S. role in this. Um, first off, it's not a recommendation. It is simply an option. Um, but the U.S. could undesignate MS-13 as a terrorist organization. Um, we heard from actors on the ground that that designation makes it hard to deal with rehabilitation programs. Uh, you cannot put funding towards rehabilitating former members of MS-13 uh, because their affiliation with what is now a terrorist organization. Um, so that is one just direct thing that the United States can do. The other one I can do, and that I see through my paper, um, especially dealing with the state of exception, is the U.S. can provide a better model. 
a lot of the Salvadoran security model is based on the U.S. model. Rudy Giuliani's policing program came up numerous times while we were in the country. Uh, the suspension of privacy, the extension of what was formerly limited suspension from three days to 15 days, those are all based on the U.S. Patriot Act. Uh, a lot of those security models come from how the United States has chosen to deal with gangs. Designation of terrorists um, also is based on a U.S. conception of how to deal with gangs on a community level. So if the U.S. provided a better security model that said, this is not the way to do it, we failed in the past, uh, you can have a more sec human security-centric focus in dealing with gangs. You can view them as a socioeconomic problem and address them as such publicly. Um, the United States could form a better model in that way, provide a better example. Um, but currently, we've provided the example that Bukele has chosen to use in terms of dealing with the gangs. And so that is yet another way in which the U.S. has negatively contributed to this issue. Thank you. We do have some questions from, uh, from, uh, from Zoom, and I will keep them after we have heard other questions here from the, from the podium. So we have two questions. Maybe we can collect both, uh, if, if possible. Hi, thank you all so much. My name is JD Mancini. I'm a first year MAIRF student. And I'm just curious about, again, sort of building off, it's a, this is a more historical question, but sort of building off the United States role. I'm curious about how the impact of the end of the Salvadoran Civil War has contributed to the security situation today with the United States in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, um, and through the 90s, uh, deporting uh, members of MS-13 back to El Salvador and how that's created um, entrenched uh, gang structures and institutions and how that's contributed. So are there any sort of long-term fissures or lacks of solutions to what happened in the Civil War that contribute to the security situation today and how the U.S. has played a role in that? It's a very, very uh, uh, important question that we've been kind of alluded to throughout the trip. So I'm, I'm going to solicit volunteers for that one, but let's hear another question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Humay Aliyeva, first year student. And thank you so much for the research for presenting. It was really in depth and particularly I was interested about the internal displaced people and their mental health issues because I think that it's part, it's an um, important topic in conflict management and I have like personally witnessed that in South Caucasus and how internal displaced people's experiences can have important long-term effects and how government deals with that. That's why like you also touched on uh, how challenging it was to collect the data. So would you mind sharing how did you collect the data? What was the main research methodology in um, about the internal displacement? Absolutely, people? thank you. Okay, so before we go to Josh's uh, uh, answer to that, let's let's just uh, get, get uh, uh, an insight on the legacies of war. Who would like to? Who would like to start with that? Legacies of civil war. Yeah, Grant. Grant seems to be the spokesperson. Well, luckily, uh, luckily, I wrote a paper about this, so <laughs> it, it helps. Um, yeah, I think one of the key findings uh, that we both heard in, in El Salvador, um, but that I think is pretty typical, is that there is, I mean, the peace process in El Salvador in 1992 was pretty successful in, in doing a lot of good things in creating this, the political parties um, for what became the FMLN and ARENA governments. However, there were a lot of, we've heard about a lot of issues with those. I think from the U.S. role and the impact of that, the U.S. certainly, you know, spent a lot of money to basically ruin the country. I mean, the Civil War is largely rooted in the U.S. willingness to spend money on, on fighting a war that decimated infrastructure that really set people back. You know, real GDP falls, all of those things. That's a, that's a very real part of it. So I think that creates long-term fissures in terms of, um, you know, how, how do you go forward from Civil War? It also, I think the Civil War but even prior to the Civil War, there's a long history of authoritarianism in El Salvador and violence and a willingness to use the government to, to fight a variety of, of opponents. And so violence is tolerated heavily in, in El Salvador. And we heard that quite often. Um, 
yeah, I think I'll pause there and see if anyone else wants to add anything. And then Josh, maybe you can join for the subsequent Hi. Um, to direct, directly address uh, the issue of deportation, we heard very competing narratives. Uh, one of which is that you know deported members of MS-13 and Barrio 18 um, founded the gangs in El Salvador and created those sort of networks. The other is that the gangs were already in El Salvador, not as MS-13, not as uh, 18th Street, but as informal structures that existed within the economy as a legacy of the war, as sort of decades-long institutions, and that the arrival meant affiliation with MS-13 and such, but that it wasn't people coming from uh, California that created these structures of violence, created a culture of violence. It was already there. Um, to speak directly to my paper, the other impact was security institutions in El Salvador. Uh, they were severely dismantled after the end of the Civil War. Uh, the police force was demilitarized. Special forces in the government were completely uh, cut. Uh, those who committed the worst crimes uh, were often let off, uh, but lost their positions in government and military. Uh, and that created a system that wasn't capable of dealing with the rising gang violence. Uh, there was no ability to really crack down on them. Uh, the comparison, though, is Haiti, where the government not only wasn't capable in terms of the law, but isn't capable at all. Uh, there are no forces that you can put together to deal with that issue. In El Salvador, you can't arrest 70,000 people in one year without a capable government that could do it. Um, so although the police force was demilitarized, although the security forces were broken up, the government was still capable of pulling off a massive crackdown. It just didn't have the legal authority to do so anymore because of the legacy of the Civil War. So once you remove those restraints, you find that the government is quite capable of being as authoritative as it was previously. Thank you, Cameron. Joshua, on the question of mental health, and then I'm going to move to the questions on Zoom to, uh, to bring those. Um, thank you very much for your, for your question. Um, internal displacement in El Salvador is very much uh, an invisible phenomenon. Um, these are not entire communities who are um, vanishing, leaving, being forced to leave. These displacements happen drop by drop. Um, and these populations are dispersed across the country. Um, so how do you deal with something that is you know, invisible to the naked eye, something that is not reported on. Um, it is difficult, it's a huge challenge. Um, so I relied a lot on um, survey data. So surveys conducted by civil society organizations, uh, data from the United Nations, from UNHCR, um, government figures as well. Um, the, the Salvadoran government recently uh, conducted a national survey on mental health now, unfortunately, those results are not aggregated by, uh, you know, populations such as uh, IDPs. So it, it kind of forced me to extrapolate and, and kind of, um, you know, predict certain characteristics from that data. Um, but, but uh, and then also previous studies that have done, there are a couple uh, studies that have been conducted in the last 10 years or so on um, internally displaced populations using a lot of uh, qualitative data interviews and such, um, which, have, which has also been, been very, very interesting. But you know, the, the, the crux of it is that um, due to the nature of displacement in El Salvador, due to the nature of you know, how IDPs are defined by, by international law, um, the fact that they fall under the responsibility of the, the Salvadoran government um, does really limit um, the the kind of agency of um, kind of international organizations and the, the kind of international community as a whole. Um, and and I think as um, as my paper shows, there are you know not that many incentives for the government to you know actively um, present and and you know conduct thorough uh, data collection um, of of this issue. Can I just um, yes, by all means. make a point again yes, on the, the data that Josh talked about? I think all of us at some point ran into an issue in our paper where we couldn't find data. Um, and I think that that's really important to point out as another tool of the government narrative and as some of the great propaganda that Danita talks about in her research. You know, I know we directly asked folks, like, how much money is being spent on this prison? 
national security, we can't share. You know, we asked, how, how are these homicide rates being disaggregated? How are you tracking them? We can't share that information. And I think that really speaks to the challenges of conflict management in this case, when there's not accessible data, when the government's controlling the data narrative, how you can go about making conflict management recommendations or installing those policies becomes a lot more difficult. So I think that was definitely something we all experienced. Thank you. All right. So we have, uh, for, uh, I'll, I'll read two questions uh, for now, uh, for the time for the for the time we have left. Uh, one is by Mr. Geoff Dale, uh, the the long serving director of Bola, who is with us on 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 Zoom. I'd like to salute him and thank him for being with us. He says, um, "Thanks and congrats to the researchers. The evidence suggests that President Bukele is unlikely to end the state of exception." or the war on gangs. Bukele is likely to be reelected next year. Over time, as resilient and more decentralized gangs emerge, are there ways in which the international community could help offer incentives for Bukele to turn away from the current approach and toward a more social and reintegration oriented approach? So we have some who were talking about international communities role, some who were talking about the resilience of gangs. So I leave it to you to decide how you want to handle that question. Another one is by Laura, who asks, uh, I would like to ask Willa, based on her paper, as well as the paper by Denita, regarding propaganda, um, how, have you see, how do you see the use of strategic narrative deployed since Bukele's announcement in September that he would run for re-election? Has anything changed since that, uh, that event? All right. How do you like to start? Nora, would you like to? be the first one to address the resilience and the transformation of gangs? Yeah, so in regard to the resilience of gangs, I mean, the gangs currently, like MS-13, their greatest strength is that they're so decentralized. I mean, you don't really need a vertical leadership. You have this very horizontal way in which these people operate, in which crime is operated. We talked a little bit about extortion earlier. In regards to the international community, I think it just comes back to recognizing them as like non-actors within the state and realizing how can you negotiate with them in terms of who are you negotiating with? Um, I think civil society would be a good start there because the clickers are so within these local communities. If you're able to bring in the civil society as a mediator, it's you're building trust among the public while also you know, the gang is able to um, adapt and uh, figure out how to communicate with the local community and build that resilience, um, not with the gang, but with the community. Thank you. Asma, do you have any further addition to the international community's role? Thank you, Nora. Um, I think it speaks to what I mentioned briefly earlier about multi-party mediation. Um, the U.S. gives about $125 million in aid every year, uh, and I think uh, by either actually pulling or threatening to pull the, that aid, uh, you can uh, in some way force the government to rethink their approach. Um, the other thing that I briefly explore in my paper is uh, whether it's in within the UN's mandate to actually uh, mediate these types of conflicts. Um, and I briefly suggest that the UN, although maybe unlikely, could adopt um, a policy similar to the our responsibility to protect, uh, which allows uh, the United Nations to enter countries uh, when there's uh, concerns about uh, genocides and other um, uh, gross, violations of human rights. gross violations of human rights, exactly. Um, so given the gang's uh, socio-political impact, uh, I think it's honestly irrelevant whether they have uh, political goals or not, uh, as they are such a big factor in the community and they impact uh, the political space. Uh, so that the UN should be able to um, treat these gangs as if they are political actors. Uh, and because of that, I think that 
adopting something similar to the RTP to protect uh, local communities uh, could be something that should be explored. Thank you, Osman. All right, uh, Mary. I can also just jump in really quickly, and if I, this wasn't directly my paper topic, so if anyone else wants to jump in and correct me, please do. Um, but something that we noticed when we talked to a lot of the international community was that there was this really difficult limitation on being able to even communicate with the government on gangs at all, um, being able to be involved in El Salvador at all if they were you know, trying to work with gangs. Um, the UN had this issue. I know the, the, the state the US has this issue as well, where if in order to continue doing work in El Salvador, they had to actually put aside discussion on policing, on gang violence, on things like that. Um, and instead focus on areas of collaboration that had nothing to do with it in order to maintain access to El Salvador. Um, and so that was one of the big challenges, I think, of the international community was um, the government would straight up cut off access, um, which was very important to the work that a lot of these international communities were doing, especially the UN. Um, they wouldn't be able to help with things like education and development if they had rehabilitation programs, things like that. And I think actually, so what a lot of the international community seems to be doing right now is going on this kind of preliminary collaborative stage where right now they can't be directly involved, but they're laying the groundwork by collaborating on other issues um, to kind of set this, to maintain a connection to the government, to maintain communication. Um, and then in the future, when the time is ripe to be able to um, actually be able to become involved in those things more directly. And I think another thing to mention, actually, uh, Josh mentioned it actually in his, in his uh, recommendations is um, uh, this, he mentioned specifically in terms of uh, IDPs, um, you know, when you're talking about displaced people, um, there was a, a shared concern between El Salvador and the US and that is migration. Um, that is something that actually Bukele and the government is really concerned about. And one of the things that um, they really pride themselves on or are hoping to achieve is bringing people back to El Salvador from the U.S. And so that right there is an opportunity for collaboration that I think really represents an avenue, um, not just for IDPs, but more broadly for the international community to, and specifically the United States, to, to be involved. But again, like I said, we're working on adjacent issues and we're not able to really focus on El Salvador. So I think that's kind of the frustration we're having right now. Uh, Tiffany, and then we'll move to Willa. We have one more question, I think, from the audience, sir. Yes, we will definitely make time. Hello. Um, talking about the international community and everything Mary said is correct. Um, my paper, um, to elaborate a little more, it had a lot to do with external, um, like foreign aid, basically, and foreign development, involvement in the development of El Salvador. And yes, it is true that they are limited in terms of, you know, policing and when it comes to rehabilitation programs. But realistically speaking, there is a lot of money involved in what are the factors that I was talking about of, that play a role in the social exclusion, which is education, which is um, the social programs and also um, building that resiliency and the idea of a family structure and a community structure, which I do think um, just on the top of my head, like Spanish aid is doing very well. USAID is also doing very well. The, U, um, the EU is doing very well. Like these are very present and programs that they have. And we, realistically speaking right now, we have to work with what we have. And that being said, it's these programs, which I allude to the fact that the government eventually can just use these as blueprints, right? The work is already there. It's known, especially like by... They have Escuela Taller by Spanish Aid, which is amazing that, you know, you give those younger generations a purpose, right? I think a lot of it, which we went back to these criminal gang groups are very different to other criminal gang groups in the region. And it's a lot about a sense of identity. So if we give this, these younger generations those sense of, I, sense, of, sense of identity through these international communities, right? The international foreign aid programs that they have there, um, I genuinely believe that eventually once the government starts seeing these differences, maybe they'll hear the food for thought in terms of policing and in terms of other things, right? But me coming from an aid perspective, I'm a very hopeful person. <laughs> so I do believe that 
the international community is actively trying to work with what they have and they are doing it pretty well too. Thanks. Thank you, Tiffany. All right, Willa and Danita. So Willa, would you like to start yeah. and Danita can join? Um, sure. So as I mentioned a little bit, um, I think we're seeing Bukele's narrative shift from this focus on you know, terrorism and gang violence to El Salvador's role in the international community. And it very much follows the trajectory that he's had for his first term. So again, in his inaugural speech, he barely mentions gang violence. He really doesn't touch on day-to-day -day security issues. But then as he faces political threats and as the gang violence ramps up, he's you know, quick to call them terrorists, quick to say it's a war on gangs. As the state of exception has succeeded, um, and there's fewer instances of that major day-to-day -day violence, his rhetoric has dropped off in the same rate. And so when he announced his plan to run for re-election, again, there was very little direct reference to the gangs as terrorists or the war on gangs. Um, he's very much positioned himself instead as standing up for El Salvador's place in the international community and sort of he's creating a new enemy. You know, as the gangs are imprisoned and they become kind of less of an enemy that he has to face on a daily basis, he's shifting his focus to countering the international community, you know, attributing El Salvador's conflict and violence as based from the international community, um, and then kind of arguing that often these international critics are, you know, the source of El Salvador's problems and are now trying to dictate how El Salvador can pursue its own recovery. So um, he's kind of followed this narrative arc with his use of the, the security rhetoric. Thank you. Anyway. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think it's really important that uh, President Bukele's narrative has, I mean, it's not surprising that he announced his re-election. All of this was quite, um, it's, a, it's a plan that has been very well executed. And two things to that is one, he does daily polling data. So every single day he knows what people are thinking on social media. It also is different audiences. So whether it's people within El Salvador, but also the population of Salvadorians that are located in the US, which are a main source of remittances uh, contributing to maybe I think 26% of their GDP. So the pop so the imaging and the narrative speaks to that as well. And he's he's been successful with it. And so far we're seeing limited resistance. And part of that success is this theory of gray propaganda where you're using true information, which, which the improved security situation is quite evident and which we all experienced while we were there in El Salvador, but also a bit of manipulation of data and the way it's presented. And I think given the circumstances, we say that some of those conditions were pre-existing, like Salvadorians' relationship to what democracy is. It's not the traditional understanding that we have here in the US or in some other countries. And so that's one aspect. And then the other aspect is just digital, the lack of digital literacy or small things that make it the fertile ground for such kind of propaganda to exist. And this is not unique to President Bukele's administration, but it is quite well executed over there. And um, I think that kind of leads a consequence of what that means for the region specifically, but then also globally where we can see this kind of anocritic kind of government take form. And I think when we hear of that term, you can you can think of more than one country that comes to mind when you when you think of it. But yeah, thank, that's it. Thank you very much, Danita. All right. Uh, gentleman in the middle. Thank you. Hi, congratulations, everybody. This has been great. Uh, my name is Ben Rempel. I'm with USAID, uh, Central America Regional Security Initiative. Uh, and given, uh, I want to pose a question to you, uh, looking at the policy environment right now, a lot of you gave really interesting recommendations on how the U.S. should engage with and try to influence the, the current government in, in, in possibly future negotiations with criminal groups. But given that we are in the situation that we are in right now with a potential opportunity with safer streets, as you all rightfully identified, and our desire collectively for El Salvador not to become more violent, and a recognition that mano dura policies historically have never worked. They work in the short term, and that's the position that we're in right now, but over time, it just leads to more violence. What should we do from a policy perspective? Should we be supporting these communities to try to build some of the community resilient structures that you alluded to um, while risking reinforcing the Bukele administration's authoritarian plan and supporting their efforts to more sustainably decrease violence. What do you think? 
Solomon? I think, uh, thank you for that. That's a really important question. Um, and there's no easy answer, to be honest. There is somewhat of a trade-off, as, as you've identified. And two of the main challenges that exist right now, or one of the main challenges, is that the aid conversation has become so politicized. And it's shrouded within the rhetoric of anti-colonialism. And of course, any government donor or international donor is going to want to impose some conditionality as uh, you know to make sure that the aid is accountable but then that's being um, leveraged rhetorically by the Bukele administration as evidence of kind of uh, colonial um, domination and imposing of, of conditions that are really not commensurate so it's a very important and and universal problem it's beyond El Salvador we see these kinds of issues you know across aid contexts um, one key thing that right what we need to do right now, or I think that uh, international or the or donor organizations can work on is depoliticizing the conversation, doing a bit of compartmentalization about the different issues, because um, I think ultimately investing in education, investing in some of those community structures that can really enforce resilience will have the most tangible long-term impact, regardless of what administration remains in the future. Um, but also one really critical aspect of that process will be to kind of foster a rapprochement between the civil society organizations and the Bukele administration. The tension is extremely, extremely high. There's some political dynamics as well underlying those tensions, but ultimately a fruitful collaboration has to emerge for really sustainable resilience building and aid and development efforts. And so if the international community can play a role, because the U.S. government, as you know, and uh, U.N. agencies, the EU have very solid relationships with community-based organizations at the very local level. And so maybe leveraging their influence to try to facilitate a detente between the government and civil society will be a crucial element of that. Um, and really strengthening the, the, the communities themselves and the civil society is going to be the best investment, regardless of that trade-off that you've identified. Anyone else? Cameron? Hi. Thank you for your question. Um, I just want to briefly challenge the assumption that monitor policies don't work. Um, I think that traditionally, yes, they've seen failure uh, across decades. Uh, I think what's unique about El Salvador is the state of exception as the situation on the ground. And that is that they are designed to be temporary. Uh, there are some carryover uh, in unstable democracies. As I said, there's democratic backsliding, there's a degree of impunity. Uh, most likely the changes to the penal code will stay as a permanent fi uh, fixture of the Salvadorian uh, justice system. But there is an acknowledgement that this is short term among government officials. Uh, they will restore the constitutional rights. They're going to change some laws around terrorism. They're going to fully sort of integrate this approach that gangs are terrorists into their constitution, most likely. Um, but there's a recognition that this is short term. However, 70,000 people in prison is hard to see as a sort of resurgence of violence. Um, if it kicks off again, they have a sort of demonstrated ability to once again, round up gang members, throw them into prison. Um, I think if you want to say monitor policy is successful in terms of resolving community and societal violence, it's not. It never will be. It never can be. Um, but in terms of the success of keeping the streets safe, I think that El Salvador provides a case study of challenging the assumption that you can't have it work. And the danger is that other countries in Central America want to replicate this model. Um, so it, it's not... Uh, positive outlook, uh, but I think that really this is a case of it working, and it's uh, bad for human rights that it does. I also want to quickly jump in, um, and also I don't want to take away too much time from you, but um, I think something interesting about uh, Manadura policing is that it has historically been used in a very political short-term sense. Um, I do, I think that one of the things that I, I found in studying populism and the appeal of populist leadership is in that it really appeals to people that don't want to be burdened with the work that democracy takes. Um, and so Mano Dura Policing has had this appeal in El Salvador long before now, um, but because it is um, effective in the short term, because it is, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't function within this democratic system, which many in El Salvador have found really frustrating and unable to meet their needs over the years. Um, that I think that is, in a sense, to Cameron's point, there is a sense that 
the long term is not their concern because they want something immediate. And, and that is, I think, a very real feeling among Salvadorians that we, we can't deny when we look at Maragoro policing is that, I mean, you know, if you, it, yeah, it, it matters more to them to be able to leave their neighborhood and come back safely every night and that their children can do that um, than to have sustainable peace and long term democracy, right? These things they don't think about on a day to day. It really is to the point um, that people really are thinking, I, a lot of them are thinking, I, you know, what, how can I, how can my life be better every single day? Um, and, and also, I think to a, a quick point that Maraduro policing has always been rather a short term tool used um, historically uh, in order to gain political favor among Salvadorians before an election, right? Both FMLN and ARENA over the years have implemented these strategically in order to foster support among the population. And so this is kind of the next, and, and you know, we have uh, Bukele who now can run, you know, twice, twice in a row, which never has been able to happen before, but in a very, you know, in a very familiar sense, this is the precedent that he's looking at, that it is short-term effective and that's what he needs and that's what he cares about. And for a lot of people in El Salvador, that's what they care about. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. This was actually an issue that I struggled with at the beginning when um, we started researching reintegration and rehabilitation uh, feasibility under the state of exception, kind of trying to identify where um, the international community and CSOs and the government can meet. Um, one of the reasons I actually found was a gender analysis proved effective was because it was kind of one of those avenues, as Mary, I think, alluded to earlier, that um, CSOs were already starting to work on this masculinity, like uh, uh, demilitarizing masculinities and women's rights. And international community has a, obviously, international donors have a large interest in funding these programs. And even though the government, um, has made steps to cut some of the woman, uh, women's programming um, because they say like the gang violence is lowered. So a lot of these domestic violence has lowered. They have made public um, uh, statements to the effect that they do support um, increase of women's rights and increase of um, uh, tackling these kind of to the, this societal issue. So I think that's kind of a, um, an example. I and mean, there are other examples such as education where you see kind of the trust and you can lay the groundwork for future programming by rebuilding trust among these donors and these different stakeholders on certain issues that are related to um, kind of cycling out of violence, but also um, can have an impact in the um, communities at that moment. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, we have taken more time than uh, initially announced. So please uh, join me in thanking the students for writing this spectacular report. As, as, as I mentioned, uh, all of our meetings were for non-attribution purposes. They were more for situational awareness while we were in El Salvador, so that gave uh, a, a perfect segue to students to continue their research and refine their findings. So uh, these are actual research projects that were carried out uh, in, in, in depth by students. So now our ambition is, as it has been for the past few uh, reports, to turn these um, uh, uh, manuscripts into a publishable uh, uh, edited volume. Uh, I can already tell you that Professor Zartman is helping me. Uh, so we have joined forces for the last year's report on Columbia to turn it into a book. And now hopefully this will be of equal success in the, in the, in the months to come. Uh, students will continue refining their papers to meet those publishable uh, quality needs. And hopefully we will be able to share these findings very shortly with wider audiences, both in electronic format and also as a, as a print version of this of this report. But nonetheless, if you are interested in this, please feel free to reach out and we can connect you with a student who wrote on that and continue the conversation on the topic that they have covered. Other than that, please uh, uh, 
Thank you very much for being with us, for joining this event, for listening to these capstone presentations. To, to our students now, congratulations on uh, graduating uh, and, and for, you know, I look forward to seeing you at the graduation ceremony next week. Enjoy the good weather that DC has these days and thank you very much. Thank you.